A clock signal is just a square wave. It doesn't matter how you get it. You could get it with some sort of crystal oscillator. You could make an oscillator, like our a-stable multivibrator that we were doing. You could have a literal switch that a human being is going on, off, on, off, on, off. It's just a sequence of on and off in a rough square wave. Just like so. You could have your circuit elements operate when the clock is high or low. You can do whatever you want. You can add as many inverters as you want. Usually, I see when the clock is high, something happens. So when the clock goes high, for example, in our flip-flop, the enable signal goes high. For this entire duration, the signals are allowed to propagate, which is great for the SR, but with the JK, we saw that it would oscillate. If this is too long, it's going to start oscillating and goofing up before it finally goes low. So what we want is pulses. Instead of this, we want something like this. We want very short pulses of high, followed by long segments of low, but at the same frequency. The frequency of the clock is determined by how long it takes for all of our logic that we need to process to process. You know, the delays in propagating between transistors we discussed in the other video? That's where we set our clock frequency. We say, do it. And then we wait and say, do it again. And we pick the lowest frequency that's safe to make sure all the transistors in the slowest part of the circuit are done. But as we can see, some parts of the circuit can be really fast. The JK flip-flop is fast. It's going to start oscillating very quickly. Well, you know, 18 other layers of logic are still doing their thing. So we want a super short clock pulse so that each part of the circuit starts doing its thing. We basically trigger it. We say start, but then we pull the signal away so that if anything wraps around, it's not a problem. So how do we get this? One way, there's multiple ways, but one of the simplest ways is with something called a delay gate. So let's say we have a signal. Let's call it C for clock. There's our clock. This is our square wave, just regular square wave from whatever source. Let's split it off. Let's come down here and let's exploit the problem we have to solve the problem. Let's use the problem to solve the problem. The problem we have is that transistors propagate with a delay. When our clock goes high, this is just a wire. It's going to have minimal resistance. It's going to have no other extra elements. So other than the stuff that's small enough to ignore, it instantaneously comes over here, and you have the same thing here and here. But here, your clock goes high. It'll go high instantly here, relatively instantly, but then it goes through an inverter, which takes a certain amount of time to propagate, and then more and more before it finally gets here. So you have the same signal. It's three inverters, so it's going to be inverted. You could have two inverters and it wouldn't. If you had just two inverters, you would get the exact same signal on both of these wires over here, except one would be later than the other by a relatively predictable amount. That amount would change slightly with temperature and so forth. But it would be roughly the same amount. Remember, I did this when I showed you the problem of transistor propagation delay where I had, let's say, one inverter and three inverters on my oscilloscope and you saw that gap. We're going to use that gap. So I have three inverters. So we have our normal square wave and we have our delayed inverted square wave. Let's have an AND gate and let's call this E. Let's call the output of that gate E. So let's say that here, is our regular square wave. Here's our regular square wave. This is C. And just for fun, let's look at the delayed inverted square wave, and we'll call that D for delay. So we have D over here. Now it's inverted, so instead of starting low, we start high. But we're delayed a little bit, just a smidge. So let's drag it out a little bit. But then the clock goes high, so our delayed signal goes low because it's inverted. Times negative 1 times negative 1 times negative 1 is negative. So now the clock is high, so D is going to be low. So we go over here, but it's delayed, remember? So when the clock goes low, D is going to go high, but not yet. So it's the exact same square wave, the same period, same everything, except it's delayed. It's phase shifted would be the term. You just took this signal, flipped it upside down, and moved it over slightly. So look at these gaps we have. This delay we have before things actually change. So now let's look at our E signal. Let's look at E, and I've run out of room. I'll just take this away, you've seen it. Or I'll just put it over here so at least it's somewhere. Your clock signal is one input to the end, the triple inverted delayed is the other, and output is E. And the triple inverted was D. So our E signal, it's an AND gate. The AND gate is high when both of its inputs are high. So when is that true? Well, right now, at the beginning, clock is low, so it's definitely not then. So E has to be zero, it has to be low, while the main clock is low. Well, now the clock has gone high, which means the 
Inverted delayed clock should be low, except it's not because it's delayed. So for this period, we've got high and high. So E is high for that brief period, but then D finally goes low. So for that brief period, it was high, but now we're low. And we are low for as long as D is low. So even though C has been high this whole time, D is low. So we're low as long as C is high, C goes low, D is low. For that little smidge, now D has gone high, but C is still low. So we're still low all the way over here, but then C goes high while D is still high, and we get our pulses. And that is rising edge triggering. On the rising edge, when C, when the clock is going from low to high on the rising edge, we get a pulse. It's deceptively simple, isn't it? We just exploit the propagation delay. And like I said, this delay will vary slightly with temperature and other things, but it won't vary enough to make a difference. You're going to get roughly a three gate delay using this pulse detection. So this pulse will be roughly three gates long. Now you have to look at your circuitry though, the JK flip-flop, which is just the SR flip-flop with a couple extra wires. This delay may actually still be too long for the JK. We have to think about it because we've got one layer at the beginning, which is where the enable signal goes in, the clock. And then we have the second layer, which is the latch. So it depends. This is why I don't really like this method, because it's too variable. It's, you, you basically have to fiddle with it. Now it will work. This is a common thing. But basically you just have to try it and see. You have to make your circuit and test it to see if the delay you're getting is correct. You know, make a JK flip-flop, make your delay gate, and you know, test it 50 times, and make sure that it's definitely long enough, but also short enough. It has to be long enough to get the JK going, but short enough that it's off by the time the JK finishes going. But that's all it is. You have your clock signal and you split it into a gate. One wire is directly into the gate. The other wire just has a bunch of gates in it to delay the second part. And your logic function determines how the pulse works. If you change the gate, you change how your edge triggered. Because remember, there's four ways. You could have a pulse to high or a pulse to low, and you could pulse on the rising edge or the falling edge. So that was the rising edge. If you wanted a pulse to low instead of a pulse to high, you just make this a NAND gate instead of an AND gate. Now, when you're using MOSFETs, you don't have to think about that. You just do it. When you are using BJTs, this is actually better because the AND gate is a problem. If you make it a NAND gate and you pulse to low, then it's easy to make a NAND gate with BJTs. But I'm not going to worry about the circuitry for now between BJTs. We'll do that when we make actual circuits, since I'm probably not going to be using this anyway, but I might. But just know that you just invert the signal, and you don't have to make it a NAND gate. You could use an AND gate and an inverter. That's what they're for. But all you do to change it to a low pulse instead of a high pulse is invert it, obviously. So let's do falling edge triggering instead of rising. We have our clock. We split it off into our three inverters. So there's our clock signal. Here is our delayed inverted clock signal. And instead of an AND gate, we use a NOR gate. And coming out of there is our falling pulse. So once again, the clock signal is just our square wave. The inverted delayed clock is the same thing except it starts high. There's a delay, it goes low. Delay goes high, delay goes low, the whole way. So we have these same gaps as before, these brief periods where they're out of sync. But now we have a NOR operation. The OR operation is one if any of its inputs are one at all. It is zero only if all of its inputs are zero. So the NOR operation, if all of its inputs are zero, the output is one. If any of its inputs are one, the output is zero. So we have to look for everywhere that the inputs are both zero. Well, the inverted delayed clock is one for all of this duration, so that means the output is going to be zero. But then we get to this gap. We see that both are one. Well, that's no good. If either of them are one, it's still zero. So for the gap, still zero. Now in here, we've got one on the regular clock, so still zero. Now we get to this gap. We've got zero on the regular clock. We've got zero on the delayed inverted clock. So now our NOR gate goes high, but now the delay finally catches up and it goes high. So we get a pulse. And just like before, we get pulses. Except this time, we get pulses on the trailing edge. It's a falling 
edge detection. The NOR gate is 1 when both of its inputs are 0. Both of its inputs are 0 only when the clock has just gone 0 and the delay hasn't caught up yet. Just like before, we got a pulse when the clock went high and the inverted delayed clock hadn't caught up yet to go low yet. It was still sitting on high. So we got a quick pulse and then the delay is like, oh crap, I'm supposed to be low now. <laughs> Same thing here. The regular clock goes low while the delay is still sitting on low, eating a sandwich. When it finally realizes it's supposed to go high, it's already sent out a pulse to the NOR gate. And that is our edge detection pulse. If you want this to be normally high and pulse low, you make this an OR gate instead of a NOR gate. You just, again, negate the output. That's all it is. And that is using a delay gate to make a pulse generator from a square wave generator. There's other ways to do it that I happen to like better, although this is perfectly functional. 100% functional, it's just fiddly to set up. I prefer using something that's a little more complex, maybe a little more expensive in terms of engineering, but a little more nice. But this is 100% valid and used all over the place. So this is how you could get your JK flip-flop to work if you wanted. So just know, when you see your flip-flops, when you see your square or your rectangle, and you've got your Q and whatever, and you've got your flip-flop, whenever you see a triangle there, that is edge detection. So now we do the other way to make a JK flip-flop that does not require pulses at all. In fact, pulses would have no effect. It takes more transistors, but it's 100% foolproof, and I particularly like it better for that reason. So until then, I'll be seeing you.